ترك الوالدان والأقربون مما قل منه أو كثر نصيبا مفروضا وإذا حضر القسمة أولو القربى واليتامى والمساكين فارزقوهم منه وقولوا لهم قولا معروفا وليخشى الذين لو تركوا من خلفهم ذرية ضعافا خافوا عليهم فليتقوا الله وليقولوا قولا سديدا إن الذين يأكلون أموال اليتامى ظلما إنما يأكلون في بطونهم نارا وسيصلون سعيرا يوصيكم الله في أمنادكم للذكر مثل حظ الأنثيين فإن كن نساء فوق اثنتين فلهن ثلثا ما ترك وإن كانت واحدة فلها النصف ولأبويه لكل واحد منهما السدس مما ترك إن كان له ولد فإن لم يكن له ولد وورثه أبواه فلأمه الثلث فإن كانوا إخوة الرجال ونساء فللذكر مثل حب الأنثيين فإن كانوا أكثر من ذلك فهم شركاء في الثلث بعد وصية يوصي بها أو دين آباؤكم وأبناؤكم لا تدرون أيهم أقرب لكم نفعا فريضة من الله إن الله كان عليما حكيما ولكم نصف ما ترك أزواجكم إن لم يكن لهن ولد فإن كان لهن ولد فلكم الربع مما ترك من بعد وصية يوصين بها أو دين ولهن الربع مما تركتم إن لم يكن لكم ولد فإن كان لكم ولد فلهن الثمر مما ما تركتم من بعد وصية تنصن بها أمدين وإن كان رجل يمرت كلالة أو امرأة وله أخ أو أخت فلكل واحد منهم السدس فإن كانوا أكثر من ذلك فهم شركاء في الثلث من بعد وصية يوصي بها أو دين غير الله وصية من الله والله عليم حليم تلك حدود الله ومن يطع الله ورسوله يدخله جنات يدخله جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها وذلك الفوز العظيم ومن يعص الله ورسوله ويتعدى حدودا يدخله نارا خالدا فيها وله عذاب مهين واللاتي يأتين الفاحشة من نسائكم فاستشهدوا عليهن أربعة منكم فإن شهدوا فأمسكوهن في البيوت فأمسكوهن في البيوت حتى يتوفاهن الموت أو يجعل الله لهن السبيلا واللذان يأتيانها منكم فآمنوا فإن تابا وأصلحا فأعرضوا عنهما الله كان توابا رحيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا صلى الله عليه واله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله Brothers and sisters in Islam, Alhamdulillah. Uh, we thank the Almighty Allah for blessing us with such a wonderful day. We thank Him for His mercies that He's bestowed upon us. We bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except the Almighty Allah. We bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is His servant and His messenger. Whosoever the Almighty Allah guides is really guided. And whosoever has gone astray has nobody to blame but themselves. Today is a Tuesday, the 19th day of Ramadan, 1441 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which also corresponds on the 12th day of May 2020. As usual, we are in our Ramadan series. And thank you very much for joining us, all the brothers who have said their salam at the time when the Quran was being recited, I couldn't respond, but I can respond to your salams now. Yes, my brother Abdulaziz Salva. Yes, we are in for a powerful session today, inshallah. Yes, I'm already in the mood. Khairan, inshallah. You know, coincidentally, we have been speaking about the Sharia, the Islamic legal system. For more than a week now that's what we've been discussing and then we looked at the objectives of the sharia yesterday what are the, some of the things that the islamic legal system looks to achieve what are the objectives of the islamic legal system so yesterday we decided to also speak about the characteristics of the islamic legal system and uh, we all know of a trending issue back home in ghana where a honorable you know member of the judiciary who happens to be a muslim who has been blessed with a nomination into the highest court of the land the supreme court of ghana and i'm being told that uh, we don't have a muslim in the supreme court of ghana and it seems this is the first appointment of a muslim going into that you know illustrious office the highest court of the land so uh this nominee was vetted yesterday by the august house of parliament in ghana and then he made some pronouncements uh, especially against the islamic legal system and the court uh and i watched the video i don't know if it is a doctored video but if it is what really happened uh, the nominee sought to make an allegation against Islam that Islam discriminates against women. And then he gave some scenarios that uh, if a Muslim man is married with uh, a Muslim woman and a Christian woman, and then he, that he himself knows that the Islamic legal system is not going to work in Ghana. So those of you, you have the video, but... The Almighty Allah knows that we didn't prepare to speak about him. It's just passing by and it happens. Because we have already been speaking about the Sharia for the past one week. But before we get to his point, let's continue with our lesson. Let's look at the characteristics of the Sharia. Within the characteristics of the Sharia, we will answer him. And then his allegations that uh, Islam discriminates against women. And then... The painful aspect of it is that he's a Muslim. And uh, that's that's why we are responding, uh, because it's a Muslim. And then he's going to sit there and then, you know, sit on cases. And if he has this biased view about the Islamic legal system, then I fear, I'm very, very afraid for, for some of us who are Muslims who might appear before him with cases. And then if he has this prejudiced mind against Islam his own religion, then if he has this idea about our young girls, my two-year-old daughter, that the school that she attends can choose to allow her to wear the hijab or not, 
and then it is not in our own way to to introduce religion to these young girls when they are old enough they can choose whatever they want to do i fear if a case of discrimination against a woman a muslim woman is brought in front of him concerning the hijab i don't know how he's going to handle that case that is why we are going to take our time today and then discuss these issues, the characteristics of the Sharia. Does the Sharia really, really intend to degrade women, discriminate against them? Does the Sharia always think about chopping off heads and hands? This is what we plan to talk about yesterday before we even knew that someone as big as him has poked our eyes. So our eyes are in tears now. You know, we need to wipe those tears seriously. So today... You might see a different me altogether because when someone touches the Sharia, it touches the Almighty Allah and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No, we won't sit down. We won't attack you. No, we will only discuss the issue. You know, dispel whatever notions you are throwing out there and then correct whatever mess you've thrown onto the streets. We need to clean it because Nadinullah bihi. This is what we worship the Almighty Allah with. When we look at the Sharia, the first characteristics that the Islamic legal system has is that it is a Rabbaniyatun Masdar. It is from a divine source, a divine origin. Excuse me. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't just get up and then create the Sharia. No. He didn't just pull it out of the air. And then the Kufa of Makkah themselves bear witness to the fact that this guy's message is on a different level. And we've discussed that into details before. So for example, you start to Shura verse 52, the Almighty Allah said, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلِلْإِيمَانِ ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم وكذلك أوحينا It's as death that we revealed to you روحا من أمرنا A spirit from amongst our affairs ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب والإيمان You didn't used to know what is the book and then what is faith ولكن but then we made it into a light that we guide with it whoever we want in our servants and verily you the prophet Muhammad you guide people to the straight path this verse lets us understand that the Islamic legal system as a whole brothers and sisters Muslims that you are listening to us is from a divine source so those of us who sit down and then we have some you know uh, thinking about some of the verses in the quran some of the hadith that no they don't suit our present times and we need to have a second look at them because you've read conventional law or because you are a judge or because you are a lawyer or because you are a psychologist or because you are a psychiatrist or because you are an engineer or because you are a doctor and then you don't have that you know level of education again in the islamic legal system from your formal or professional work you use that lens to view the quran and the sunnah so you make pronouncement anyhow you want understand the first characteristics of our islamic legal system is the rabbaniyatun masdar is of divine origin that is why that you find that the quran it's the only book in the world since its revelation 1400 years ago till date that is unadulterated that is not modified that has no new additions that has no changes that is memorized by more than 500 million people in the world that is being read daily by close to 2 billion people in the world on daily basis as a routine at least five times a day that is the only book in the world and then this book was received by an unlettered man who didn't know how to write that is how divine the quran gets and it's the only book in the world that you have it being memorized cover to cover. 
by millions of people in the world. And that is the Quran. The Almighty Allah also tells us in Surah An-Nahl, verse 89, that وَيَوْمَ نَبْعَثُ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ And then the day that we are going to raise up every nation, with a witness upon them from amongst themselves. The verse is talking about on the day of Qiyamah, that on the day of judgment, where the Almighty Allah is going to raise every community, every nation. And with every nation, there is a witness upon that nation from amongst themselves, which means prophets were sent to these nations. And these prophets will be witnesses upon these people. And Almighty Allah says, وَجِئْنَا بِكَ شَهِيدًا عَلَى هَؤُلَىٰ And you, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm also going to bring you on the Day of Judgment as a witness upon these people, these Muslims. وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ We revealed unto you a book. تِبْيَانَ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ Which explains everything. وَهُدًا It's a guidance. وَرَحْمَةً A mercy. وَبُشْرَى A good news. Lil Muslimin for those who have surrendered their will to the Almighty Allah. So this book that we have, this legal system that we have, is of divine origin. And amongst some of the signs of its divine origin is that there is no legal system in the world that is being adhered to, to the letter like the Islamic legal system. Let's give you a simple example. We are in the month of Ramadan. Islamic legal system says Muslims should fast from dawn to dusk for 29 or 30 days in this month. Two billion Muslims are fasting. I don't think there is any law in this world that is being at the head to by two billion people at the same time. There is no law in the world. There is no legal system in the world. And I can say this without any ambiguity or any fear or favor. I, don't, I can put my head on the guillotine for this, that there is no legal system in the world that you find 2 billion people adhering to it at the same time. Except this Islamic legal, this Islamic, you know, legal system, this law, this Sharia. That because of some people's ignorance, when they hear the word, the word Sharia, uh, they are afraid. They have that this phobia in them. And it's not only about non-Muslims. Even some Muslims, when they hear the word Sharia, they get scared. They think it's all about chopping heads and then beating people and then destroying them. So the number one, you know, char characteristic of the Sharia is that it is divinely... Its, its, its origin is divine. Number two, I don't have much time today and I have... <laughs> let them take the head. If it is for the Almighty Allah, let them take it. No problem. Number two is the Islamic legal system is universal. Alameen. Universal. When we say it is universal, it means that the Islamic legal system is not only for Muslims. Because the Almighty Allah in Islam is considered as the God and the Lord of everything and everybody. That is why when you open the Quran now, the first chapter, the first verse, you find Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Thanks, adorations, praise, and appellations be to Allah, the sustainer of the universe. Humans. Animals, trees, the galaxies. The Almighty Allah is the God and the Lord for all of us. Yesterday, in the objectives of the Sharia, I refer you to this video, to that video, yesterday's video. If you cannot find it on Facebook because of a lot of scrolling, go to my YouTube page. 
with the same name that you see on Facebook here. The video is there. The objectives of the Sharia. And then we saw that the Sharia gave rights to minorities. And we made mention of the Charter of Medina, where you have Jews, Christians, and Muslims signing a Charter of Collaboration. And then the predominant people in that community were Muslims. Islamic law recognized the rights of minorities for them to live peacefully to enjoy their stay within the Islamic community and also their freedom of worship. There were Jews in Medina when the Prophet was alive. There was Jews in Mecca and in Medina during Abu Bakr time, during Umar's time, during Uthman's time, during Ali's time. They were there. So our legal system doesn't discriminate against people outside our religion. So you find many verses in the Quran that says, Kuliya ahl al kitab, O oh, you people of the book. The Jews and the Christians are respected in our books that they are called people of the book. Knowledge is being associated with them. And then the terminologies, the choice of words that the Islamic legal system uses in addressing them is that of love, care, understanding. Come to common terms between us and you. That we don't worship anybody except the Almighty Allah. The Quran went on further to even tell us, You see these Jews and Christians, not all of they are not all of the same character. Even though some of them they have bad nuts in them, there are good people in them. The Quran testifies to that. That is why the Almighty Allah tells us in Surah Al Furqan, the first verse Tabarak al Ladi Nazal al Furqan ala abdihi liyakuna lil alamina nadira. The Almighty Allah says, Blessings be to the Almighty who revealed the criterion for us, a warning for the whole of humanity. During the time of Umar ibn Khattab, Sayyidina Ali had an issue with a Jew. And then he dragged the Jew to Umar ibn Khattab. Jews were given a fair hearing in Medina during the time of Umar ibn Khattab. A Jew could report a Muslim to the judge and then the judge will judge accordingly between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. Amr ibn As was the governor of Egypt during the time of Umar ibn Khattab. And then the son of Amr ibn As beat a Coptic Christian in Egypt. This Coptic Christian left Egypt and then came to Medina. He came to report Amr ibn As and his son to their boss. And when they came, he reported them that this is what happened. He was beaten by the son of Amr ibn As. So Umar sent a message that he needed Amr ibn As and his son to come to Medina. When they came to Medina and Umar ibn Khattab listened to the case, he gave a stick to the Jew, the, the Coptic Christian, and he said, beat Amr. The Coptic Christian said, no, Amr ibn As, the Sahab of the Prophet Muhammad said, he didn't beat me. It was his son that beat me. We were in a race and I won. And then out of anger, he beat me with his stick. And then Umar ibn Khattab said, no, beat Amr ibn As. Because Amr's son beat you because he felt his father was the governor at that time. He felt he had a leverage or a privilege above you because of his father. So beat him rather. The other Sahaba were, how can you allow you know, him to beat Amr? Amr didn't beat him. He said yes, because Amr's son felt because his father was the governor, so he could do anything he wants. In the end, the boy was rather beaten. 
And Umar looked at Amru and then he told him, Ya Amru, Matasta'abattumun nas waqad waladathum ummahatuhum ahrar. When did you begin enslaving people? When their mothers had given to them as free, given birth to them as free men. This is our Sharia. You recognize everybody's rights. The Jew dragged Ali to Umar bin Khattab in Medina. Ali, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad the in-law of the Prophet Muhammad a Jew in Medina had an issue with them and then they stood in front of Umar. During the hearing of the case, Umar was always referring to Ali as Ya Abel Hassan, oh the father of Hassan, oh the father of Hassan. But then he referred to the Jew with the Jew's name without using the same form of respect that he gave Ali. After the case was, you know, when the verdict was given, Ali said, Amir al-Mu'mini, I have a complaint. He said, what is it? You look sad. Didn't I, you know, meet our justice and fairness? He said, no, you, you, you took care of the case very well. But then the issue is that you didn't, you are not fair with the Jew. Omar said, in what case? He said, you kept on calling me Abul Hassan, the father of Hassan, the father of Hassan. But then you didn't call the Jew by that way of respect. You didn't, you know, put us onto the same level. That is why I'm not happy. Someone comes in and he says that our Islamic legal system discriminates against our women. <laughs> Let's go to the third characteristics of the Sharia. The first one we said it has divine origin. The second one we said it is universal. It doesn't discriminate against anybody. The third one is at wa shumul. This is what we are going to talk about. When we talk of at wa shumul, it means that the Islamic legal system encompasses everything. Every nitty gritty of life, there is, there is, there is a law. A ruling in Islam that speaks directly or indirectly about it. Brothers and sisters, how to even go to toilet in Islam has been taught. That is why even the Jews in Medina used to mock the Muslims that, hey, you people, what kind of followership is this? Muhammad even teaches you how to go to toilet. Yes, Islam teaches us how to go to toilet. A religion that teaches you how to go to toilet will forget about how to distribute interest inheritance. A religion that teaches you how to pray eclipse. When there is eclipse, this religion has a special prayer for praying for during the time of eclipse. Whether it's eclipse of the moon or eclipse of the sun. There is a special prayer for that. This religion teaches that, but then it discriminates against women. The longest verse in the Quran is an economics verse. An economic verse. Surah Al-Baqarah, Quran chapter 2, verse 282, is the longest verse in the Quran. It speaks extensively about record keeping and bookkeeping in business. This Quran, this legal system that talks about record keeping and the bookkeeping in the Islamic legal system will discriminate against women when it comes to Islamic inheritance. Let me go straight into that substantive issue because that's what we're going to talk about. Family issues. When someone dies in Islam. The nominee made the point that when he said even within Islamic marriages where all the wives are, 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 are Muslims, when a man dies, there must be some, he used some word, I don't know that word, it's an immunity or an immunity that if they have to agree because the sharing is going to be disproportionate. This is stark ignorance. And what hurt me was that he was displaying his ignorance arrogantly too. 
That's the painful part. The honorable members were giving him an opportunity to rethink what he was saying. They were rephrasing the question to pull his mind because and I, I, the voices I heard was like Ayariga or so, I don't know, I'm not really sure. But then it seems the questioner was asking him the question was a Muslim. And then he was trying to, you know, you're my Muslim brother. And then you're aspiring to this high office. The president has nominated you. You are here in front of us. These questions that we are asking you, we just want you to, to, to you know, to, to, to put the minds of our brothers and sisters, Muslims, at peace that, yes, we have a brother there who has us at heart and at mind. So they were trying to, you know, pull your mind that, no, look at what you are saying. But he was insisting that this is what I stand for. This is what I believe. And do you know what caught my eye? On the 22nd of March this year, One of our you know, foremost journalism journalists, Sarauta, you know, Sariu Sarauta, SSS of Marhaba, he, he posted something on Facebook that I was very happy about. He said, uh, 22nd March, I think it was almost around 11 a.m., he posted something on Facebook. You can go to his wall, Sariu Shaibu Sarauta. My wonderful uncle. He posted something on Facebook. He was feeling optimistic with Zongo development and Imoro Baba Isa. 22nd March. 10.48 a.m. Ghana time. It was 6.48 here in the United States at that time in the morning. He wrote, Quran recitation for the nation, especially in these trying times of COVID-19 pandemic, at the residence of Supreme Court judge nominee, Justice Amadou Tonko, social distancing appreciably adhered to. Hashtag Sadoki TV online. Hashtag spread calm, not fear. So our nominee believed in the importance and then the reverence and then the power of the Quran. That he invited scholars to come to his house to read the Quran as a way of seeking intercession from the Almighty Allah to wipe away this COVID-19. Fast forward less than two months later, he sits in the parliament of Ghana and tells us that the Quran discriminates against women. He invites scholars to come and read Quran in his house. But then, less than two months later, he sits in the parliament and then tells us that the Quran discriminates against the women. I can't put my head to it. Which of the Qur'ans did he read in his house and which of the Qur'an is he referring to as being discriminatory against women? So you can check on Sarota's uh, page on Facebook, 22nd March, 10.48 a.m. You can, I've read it, you can search it on Facebook and then you'll get it, inshallah. So, how come? That he has this, this idea. And then as I was saying, all these days about students of knowledge, keep quiet if you don't know anything. You see that I'm, in, I'm being vindicated. Those of us who are in Thanawi, who jump at every opportunity to give fatwas left, right and center, I was cautioning you. At the same time, I was cautioning those Muslims who did not study Islam, but then they've taken it upon themselves to speak any way they want in Islam. This is part of the problem. This is part of the problem. You don't know anything about Islamic inheritance, even though you are an appeal court judge. You are a judge. But then, when it comes to Islamic legal system, you don't know anything about it. When you were asked there, you should have found a more political way of answering the question. Dodge it. They won't put a knife on your neck for you to answer. Apart from that, you had access to scholars. When you were being nominated, you could have gone to the scholars and said, 
I need to answer one, two, I need to know one, two, three, four, five about the Islamic legal system. You have a fair view of where the controversial points are concerning Islamic law. So you go to the scholars and say, okay, what does Islam really say about the inheritance of a woman? You take your notes. Okay, what does Islam really say about polygamy and polygyny? Marry more than two wives. What does it say? You take your point, your, your notes. Okay, what does Islam say about so so and so adoption? You you take your point. You didn't do that. You come on national television, you are being asked questions about your religion, you failed woefully, and then you ex exposed your ignorance arrogantly. It wasn't even done with humility. That, oh, I will have to recheck. No, I don't know what you wanted to achieve, what you wanted to gain. Normally, I don't speak about people on my programs. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. This was a huge opportunity for us Muslims. That a Muslim judge is going to sit on the bench in the Supreme Court. But look at how it ended up. Instead of us rather supporting you, you've turned the whole issue down. We now have to fight you. How are we sure that you are going to represent us? How is it sure that as Muslims, we will be safe? from your judgment when you look at our whole Islamic legal system as being discriminatory. When we appear before you and you are the judge in a case and a girl brings a case to the court, a uh, discrimination against her from wearing the hijab, then how sure are we that you're going to give a legal, a, 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 a fair hearing when even at your vetting, you downplayed the importance of hijab to our daughters. Our wives are not allowed to wear the hijab. Our daughters are facing that discrimination. Our sisters the same. We were feeling that, oh, alhamdulillah, since this Muslim judge is being, you know, nominated on the Supreme Court, at least we will have a Muslim voice there. Not that he's going to rule everything in favor of us. No. But then at least we, will know, we know that we have a brother there. Someone who will be ready to support. But then here is the case. On the day of your vetting, you threw us down the dream. And you are saying categorically that the Islamic legal system discriminates against women when it comes to inheritance. If someone of your caliber is saying this on national television... How then will we, we, these ones that people don't know, be able to convince our sisters in the community that no, come and stick to the Islamic inheritance? Because you didn't know, and you don't know, and you don't want to know, and then you arrogantly displayed your ignorance. That is where it has landed you now. Social media was whitewashed with you yesterday. Our women, some few months ago, organized a protest, a walk, a walk around for the discrimination that they are facing because of hijab. And then less than a year, you come and then you throw all that down the drain. More less than a year. These girls were these not girls, sorry. These ladies had to be summoned to the police station. They worked tirelessly. What is their aim? Their aim is that the rights of women, Muslim women in this country, shouldn't be trampled upon. Kudos to them. They are not. Supreme Court judges, they are not appeal court judges. They are our wives, our sisters, our daughters who are going through that day-to-day -day activities normally. But then they felt that, no, let's not sit down. Let's get up and do something for us, for our sisters. 
Maybe we are powerful enough in our workplaces. We are entrepreneurs. We can put on the hijab. What about our sisters who don't have that power? What about our daughters who don't have that power? What about those, you know, people down the ladder there at their workplaces, if they are being trampled upon, they don't have the voices to stand for their rights. We will put our heads on the line for that. Our sister did that. You have come to throw that all down the drain. How am I sure that my two-year-old daughter, when she brings a case in front of your court, you are going to be fair? When you don't see the essence of hijab? Does it mean that... Let me not go far. I want to control myself seriously. I want to be charitable. I don't want to... I don't want it to be as an attack. I want it to rather be an education because he needs that education. And those sheikhs near him, educate him. Call him to order. He should even come and apologize to us. Because your excellency, the president, if you are listening, I don't believe this man serves our interest. If you are nominating him because he's a Muslim, then he doesn't serve the interest of Muslims. But if you are nominating him because he is a judge, who you want to be on the Supreme Court, fine, you can go ahead. But then if you are nominating him so that at least there is going to be a Muslim voice on the bench, then he is not going to represent our interests. Because he made it clear that he doesn't care. And that if any institution discriminates against a Muslim girl, because of the hijab, if the case is brought in front of him, he is going to rule in favor of the institution. He said it clearly that it is the institution's decision. What the nominee failed to understand is that the Islamic legal system, when it comes to inheritance, doesn't distribute estates according to gender. No. This is where he had that warped ideology. The Islamic legal system in sharing inheritance, it is not based on gender. Because you are a man, so take this. Because you are a woman, so take this. No. There are four scenarios that a man and a woman inherit together. And each of these four scenarios has something, some examples under them. I'm going to, we are going to look at these four scenarios and then some of the examples under them. The first scenario, that is where a woman inherits half of what the man will inherit. That is where, that one of the scenarios that he knew. So he said, yes, there is a scenario where it is two is to one, where the man will inherit twice that of the woman. That is the first scenario. Twice that of the woman. And this scenario, under it, it has two classes. So the first class we are going to look at, we are going to look at the two is to one that he said. That Islam discriminates against women. We are going to look at the two is to one that he said. And under this two is to one, we have two classrooms. The first classroom is the woman inherits half of what the man inherits as an agnate. The example is if a man dies and then he leaves a son and then a daughter a son and a daughter. These are the only people who are going to inherit him. A son and a daughter. That in this instance, the son will take twice what the girl would take. Why? Because Islam has given that young man responsibilities. That girl, his sister, is under his responsibility. If they are living in the same home, he pays the rent. She doesn't pay anything. He takes care of their home. He buys the food. He pays the bills. 
When she is sick, he is going to take care of her from his share. So if you give them 50-50 and then you still give him that responsibility, have you done justice? Definitely not. So Islam gave him double because Islam has given him double responsibility over his sister. So she's under his care until the day she gets married and then she goes to stay with her husband. Then her upkeeping is transferred to her husband. If for any reason she gets out of the marriage, she comes back to him. It is his responsibility to take care of her. If she doesn't have any sons who are old enough, he takes care of her out of that one. So they take one one, the other one she shares with him. But then his share, her share, he doesn't share with her. That is one. The second scenario under this one is when someone dies and then he leaves, he doesn't have children, which means his children died before he died. So he has left behind grandchildren. And the grandchildren are between, are from his sons. For example, if... I die, but then I had kids before I died, and, and my kids died before me. And then my kids, before they died, they had given birth to a son and a daughter. Or my son, he has given birth to a son and a daughter before he died. But even though he died before me, in sharing the intestate, it is the same as a son and a daughter. It becomes now a grandson and a granddaughter. The same reason. The second, third point, if someone dies and then he leaves a brother and a sister, and this brother and a sister are from the same mother and same father as the person, for example, me, when I die, and then my brother and my sister from the same mother and same father are alive, and they are the ones who are going to inherit me, they take two is to one, because my brother, my sister is under the care of my brother, she doesn't pay any, any bills. She doesn't take care of anything. My brother must take care of it. The third one is, if someone dies and then he leaves a brother and a sister, but then through his father, it means he leaves stepbrother and stepsister from his father's side. And then he dies and they are the ones who are going to inherit him. Then the sister will inherit half of what the brother will inherit. So in this instance, you see that the woman inherits half of what the man will inherit. Mr. Judge, you are true. You are right there. The second class in this first class of where the woman inherits half of what the man inherits is that there are some instances where it is only women or a man is going to inherit. For example, if my wife dies, and then I am the sole inheritor, and then we don't have any children, I'm entitled to half of her estate. But then, if I die, and my wife survives me without any children, she gets a quarter of what, I'm, what I leave behind. I hope you understand here. So, if you die, if I die and I leave my wife, and then we don't have any children. She will inherit a quarter of the estate. But when she dies, and then I survive her, and then we don't have any children, I get half. So here again, the woman inherits half of what the man will inherit, even though they are not together, because a man and a wife cannot die at the same time. And a man will inherit the wife, and a woman will inherit the husband. No. The other example is that, okay, what if, we left children behind. If I die, my wife inherits me and then we have children. Here, she enjoys one eighth of the intestate. But if she dies and I survive her and then we have children, I enjoy a quarter of that. So in these two scenarios, two classes, we find out that the man inherits twice that of the woman. That is the first scenario. The second scenario is where the woman inherits exactly what the man inherits. The second scenario is 
when the woman inherits exactly what the man inherits. Let's give an example. If I die and I'm survived by my daughter and my father, these are the two people who are left to inherit me. Because in Islam, there are people who can inherit. Not everybody inherits in Islam. So if I die and I leave behind a daughter and my father, my daughter takes half of the intestine. My daughter inherits half of the interstate. And then my father takes the other half. Ta'asiban as an agnate in agnation, which means he is the only male hair left. So whatever is uh, interstate is distributed, whatever is left goes to him. So if what is left is one third, it goes to him. If what is left is a quarter, it goes to him. If what is left is, you know, one sixth, it goes to him. So because the daughter has been given, if you die and then you are survived by a, a daughter alone, the Islamic legal system has given her half of the estate. So if she is with your father in inheriting you, they split it 50-50. The second example here is if you die, if me, I die, not you, me, I die. And then I leave behind a grandson through my son. Even though my son has, he, he died before me. If my son is alive when I die, then my grandson cannot inherit me. But if my son dies before me, and when, I'm, when I die, his son will move up the ladder and now represent his father and inherit me. That's the Islamic legal system. That's inheritance in Islam. This thing all has been packaged by the Almighty Allah for us. Someone comes and then he says, it discriminates against women. Hmm. If I'm being survived by a grandson and then a grandfather, see, the Islamic legal system considers the inheritance of a grandfather. So if I die and I'm being survived by a grandson and then a grandfather, no, a granddaughter and then a grandfather. The granddaughter moves to become a daughter and then she takes half of the estate. And then my grandfather also takes half of the estate as a, an agnate because he's the only hair left. So the rest goes to him. The third scenario. We are in the scenario where the women enjoy exactly as the men. In the sharing of the estates. If I die and I leave behind a son and a father and then a mother, the mother, my mother and my father are entitled to one sit each, one six, one six, that's it. My father wouldn't inherit more than my mother, one six, one six. So I don't know how this is discriminatory. If my daughter and my father share my in my estate and my daughter gets 50% of the estate and my father also takes 50%, in that man's logic and understanding and reading and research is discriminatory. If I'm survived by a granddaughter and a grandfather and they both share 50-50, is discriminatory. If my father and my mother survive me and they both take one sit one sit of my estate, it is discriminatory. If I die and I leave behind a grandson through my son and then I'm survived by my grandfather and grandmother, they both take one sixth, one sixth. It is discriminatory. If I die and I leave behind a daughter and then a grandson through my son, the daughter takes half and then my grandson also takes half. is discriminatory. These are the four instances where a woman can inherit exactly as what the man inherits. There are many examples under that section where they both share 50-50. Let's jump. The, the, the examples are plenty. I have almost like four or five papers here. The third scenario is where the woman inherits more than the man. Yes, listen. 
where the woman inherits more than the man. If I die, and then I leave a daughter, and then a mother and a father, my daughter will take half of my estate. My mother and my father take one sixth, one sixth each. My daughter inherits more than my father. So where is the discrimination here between the, my father and my daughter? So the man just thought that Islam just gives estate based on male and female. And that's it. So if you are a male, automatically you will enjoy more than the female. If I die and I leave a daughter with my mother and my father, my daughter takes half of the estate. And then my mother and my father are entitled to one seat, one seat each. If I die and then I'm survived by my granddaughter and my grandfather and grandmother, my granddaughter takes half of my estate. My grandfather and my grandmother take one sixth, one sixth each. My granddaughter inherits more than my grandfather. If I die, let's go to another example. If my wife dies and then she leaves behind a daughter, And me, her husband. And then her father. So my wife dies. She leaves behind. I survive her with my daughter and my and her father. Our daughter will take half. And me, the father, will take quarter. My daughter will inherit from her mother more than what I will inherit. And my father and her and my mother, my, my wife's father will take one seat. If my wife dies and then I survive her with our daughter and my wife's father, my daughter will inherit more than me from my wife. Hmm. You know, it's painful when you have to react to a fellow Muslim brother. When he makes such a big gaff, it's, it's very painful. And someone of his stature shouldn't be making such mistakes at all. We now have to contend with having problems with our own brother when it comes to in inheritance issues in Islam. Why, why should we do this? I'm not even enjoying this. I'm not enjoying it. It's just that it is a manner that we must come out and come and, you know, beat that thing out. But it's not something we enjoy doing. <laughs> if I die, and I leave a mother and a sister who we share mother and father with. My sister from the same mother and same father. And then a brother from only my father. Listen, if I die and I leave a mother and a sister from the same mother and father. And then a brother from the father side only. You see, Islamic law is very, very deep. In distributing the, the inheritance, Islam knew that definitely there are going to be all these relations. A brother and a sister from the same mother and father. A sister from only a father. A sister from only a mother. A brother from only a father. Because Islam understands there's going to be polygyny. Poly, it's going to be polygyny. And these relationships, relationships were all going to crop up. So in distributing interstate, it considered all these people. So if I die, my mother inherits one sixth of the inheritance. My sister takes half of that. And the rest goes to my brother from my father's side. And definitely taking half and someone taking one sixth. What is left is below what my sister would take. So we have scenarios to where the woman inherits greater 
than what the man will inherit. There is also another scenario where the woman inherits more than the man. But then, it is the inheritance of the man. But if we substitute the man with someone equivalent to him from the sister's side, what the woman will inherit will be more. If I give an example, you understand better. If a woman dies, and then she leaves behind two sons, and a husband, and a mother, and a father. A woman dies, she leaves behind two sons, a husband, a mother, and a father. The husband will inherit quarter of the estate. The mother and the father will inherit one sixth one sit each. The rest goes to the sons. But then, if a woman dies, and then instead of leaving behind two sons, she leaves behind two daughters, a mother, a father, and a husband, then the daughters here will inherit two thirds of the estate, more than what the boys will have inherited. I hope you understand. If a woman dies and then she leaves two sons, a husband, a mother, and a father, the husband takes a quarter, the mother and the father takes one seat, one seat, whatever is left goes to the sons. But then if it were daughters, they would take two thirds of the estate and then the rest of the one third will be shared between the husband, the mother, and the father. So in this case, if women were in there, they would inherit more than men. Another example. If a woman dies, and then she leaves a husband, and then a mother, and then a brother who is from the same mother and father. She leaves behind a husband, a mother, and then a brother who is from the same side of her as mother and father. The husband takes half because she doesn't have children. The mother takes one third, and then the rest goes to the brother. But then, if we substitute that brother with a sister, the sister will inherit half. So, the husband takes half. The sister also takes half. So, for example, if, I, if my wife dies, and then she leaves behind me, the husband, and then her brother, and then her mother, me, the husband, I will take half. Her mother will take one third. Whatever is left... Her brother will take it. But then if she leaves behind a sister instead of the brother, the sister is entitled to half of what she will leave behind. So ordinarily, the brother will have got, gotten a quarter, but the sister in that same scenario will take half. I hope you understand. Let's go to the next scenario. The scenarios are plenty. The fourth one is places where the woman will inherit and then the man will not even appear at all. If a man and a woman are the sole survivors of a person, in some situations, the woman will block the man from inheriting. <laughs> So now the man will say, Islam is discriminating against them. As someone said, Islam discriminates against women in, in inheritance because he didn't read, he didn't know. And then he arrogantly displayed his ignorance there. <clears throat> there are instances where a woman will block a man from inheriting. We call it al-hajab in Islam. In, 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 in the Islamic, you know, interstate succession law, we have two forms of blocking. We have hajib hirman and hajib nuqsan. We have the, 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 the partial partitioning and then we have the full partitioning. The partial partitioning happens when, for example, if uh, my wife dies and then she doesn't leave behind any children, I take half of the estate. But if she dies and then we have children, because of the existence of children, my share is reduced from half to quarter. So that is partial blocking. But then full blocking is if a person dies and then he leaves behind a daughter and then a brother from his mother's side 
when I die. And then I leave behind a daughter with my brother, my stepbrother, but from my father's side, my daughter blocks him. Haji Bihirman. Because she is there, he can't inherit me. <laughs> because she is available, he can't inherit me. If I die and I leave behind a daughter and a brother who is from the same mother and same father as me, and then a brother who is from my father's side, my stepbrother from my father, because my daughter is available, my brother from my father's side, my brother, my brother, who we share the same father with, my daughter will block him from inheriting me. If I die and I leave behind a granddaughter from my son's side and I leave behind brothers and sisters from my mother's side, my granddaughter will block my brothers from my mother's side from inheriting me. Their availability denies him from inheriting me. But if they were not available, he will inherit me to, to automatically. But because they are available, Islam says they are more paramount than him to me in inheritance. So he will have to relax and they will inherit me. And there are some, the final one, we can't talk about Islamic inheritance in one sitting. The final one is when a woman die, uh, the final one is that there are instances where a woman will inherit. If her equal of a male gets in there, he won't get anything. There are instances where a woman can inherit, will inherit. But if her equal from the male side is brought in, zero. What is the example? If a woman dies and then she leaves behind a husband, a mother, a father, a daughter, and then a granddaughter from his son's side. I hope you get that. So a, has a woman dies. She leaves behind a husband, a mother, a father, a daughter, and a granddaughter from her son's side. The husband will take a quarter because there is a daughter. The mother will take one sixth. The father will take one sixth. The daughter will take half, taking more than her father. And then the granddaughter will take one sixth. And then this mas'ala will turn. Ya'ul. Hadil mas'ala sata'ul. This mas'ala will turn. And then the granddaughter will get her one sixth in calculation. But then, if we take away that granddaughter to the son side, and then we bring in a grandson to a, a, the son, that grandson will not get anything to take because he will wait when everything is finished. Whatever is left, you'll be taken. But then in this masala, nothing will be left. So the grandson will not enjoy the estate. Whereas the granddaughter, who is of the same father as this grandchild, in this scenario, if it was a granddaughter, the granddaughter will inherit, but then her brother. If he was the sole survivor then, he wouldn't inherit. So Islam has made some provisions that in some circumstances where the woman will inherit, if you substitute her for a man, the man won't inherit. The second example, if I die and I leave behind my father and my mother's mother, so my grandmother from my mother's side, I die, I leave behind my father. What if she didn't have children with her husband? Will he still inherit her? Yes, even if she doesn't have children with her husband, and then she dies as his wife, and she has other children somewhere, those children will cut the share of the husband down. If she didn't have any children with him or another man, then he will take half of her estate. So long as the marriage was alive before she died. 
But then, if she had children with him or another man, then his share would move from half to a quarter. Thank you for that question. So if I die, and I leave behind a mother, sorry, a father, and then my mother's mother, my grandmother from my mother's side, my grandmother from my mother's side will take one-sixth of the estate. But then, if we substitute my mother's mother with my mother's father, this is my mother's father. He wouldn't inherit anything because originally he doesn't even belong in the inheritance. But his wife, who is my mother's mother, will inherit me. My grandmother from my mother's side will inherit me. But my grandfather from my mother's side, who is her husband, will not inherit me in any way. Finally, if, I, if my wife dies and then she leaves me and then her sister who is the same mother and the same father and then a brother who is from her father oh sorry, a sister who is from her father she leaves me behind with a sister who is of the same mother and same father and then a sister who is from the father I will take half because we don't have any children and she didn't have any children. Her sister will also take half. The sister from the same mother, same father. And then the sister from the same father will take one sixth. But then someone will say, if I have taken half and then her sister has taken half, then what is left for this to take one sixth? This is Mas'alat al -awl. It is in succession law in Islam. It's called Mas'alat al -awl. It will turn. The fractions will have to be looked at again. So her sister from the father's side will take one sixth of it and then if we substitute the sister from the father's side with a brother from the father's side he will take zero. Salim is saying Count, could you please go through everything one more time? <laughs> is Yes. It's very complex. It's a science on its own. Distribution of inheritance in Islam cannot be done on one person or two persons. Or at least you should be five people looking at all this masala. You need to look at everybody who inherits or who doesn't inherit. Sometimes we end up giving estate to people who do not inherit. And then we deny people who inherit. So what, what we are trying to say today is that uh, the Honorable Nominee who, for one reason or the other, arrogantly displayed his ignorance about the Islamic law, where he said the Islamic legal system discriminates against women in inheritance. And originally, we were talking about Islamic law, Islamic legal. That was what we were talking about throughout this Ramadan thing for almost seven, eight days. That's what we were discussing. So it was just a mere coincidence that he came in and then we had to address it. What I want to say is this. If you are not an expert in the field, keep quiet, please. These times that we are in, the experts are the medical officers. We all listen to them. You don't hit your head and then say whatever you want. This goes to especially our Muslims who have only secular education background. Please. Refer to the appropriate quarters when issues about Islamic law rises. Don't think by the virtue of the fact that you speak good Queen's English and then you have access to the internet, you can Google anything you want. Google is not a hub for knowledge. Google is a hub for information. Yes, there's a difference between information and knowledge. If your phone has problems right now, you can Google and search and then load up the information what the problem that you are facing. And then Google will give you feedback. But then you can't repair the phone. You'll have to take it to the technician to repair. So it's with pain that I'm doing this today. That instead of rejoicing that a fellow Muslim has been nominated to the Supreme 
court of Ghana, we are here ha having, ha we are here trying to rebut what he has said in his vetting. That's why it's painful. Instead of us here trying to, you know, send him congratulatory messages and advices, and then trying as much as possible to see how best we can all, you know, work together to help alleviate the problems, to help, you know, solve the problems Muslims are facing in the, in, in the laws that, that are there in the country. We are here trying to discredit him. It is not our doing. It is not what we want to do. It's not that we are happy doing it. But then he has put his hands into our eyes. And then when someone pokes their hand into your eyes, definitely you will have to wipe your eyes. Because for a Muslim who I know to call scholars, sheikhs, to come to his house to read Quran on the 22nd of March, then less than two months, on the 11th of May, he will come and tell us that the Quran discriminates against women. He's being asked about the rights of my daughter to wear the hijab. And then he downplays it. And then he makes nonsense of it. How then will I have the peace of mind that this guy will really represent Muslim voices on the bench? So, Mr. President, I'm saying, if you are listening to us, the guy, if you are nominating him because he's a Muslim, and then you want to have a balance on our bench, at least to have Muslim voices, I want you to know that he's not representing us. Because the law that we Muslims adhere to, the Quran and the Sunnah, he has downplayed it. He has relegated it to the background. He has dragged it in the mud that it discriminates against women. Our women are the number one in our lives in Islam. Nobody is more revered in Islam than the woman. When she is a daughter, she is the gateway of paradise for her father. If she is a wife, she completes half the religion of her husband. If she is a mother, paradise is under her feet for her children. So if this Islamic legal system is, has given the woman all these accolades, and then someone who is an adherent of the religion will come and make such a pronouncement on national television at a time whereby he's being vetted into the Supreme Court of our land. How sure are we that he's going to represent our interests as Muslims if the president, you are nominating him because he's a Muslim. But if you are nominating him because he is just any judge, then no problem, go ahead and do it. But we won't recognize him as someone who is going to help our cause as Muslims. It is a sad day for us as Muslims. Yes, because someone told me, I don't know, that it seems we don't have any Muslim as a Supreme Court judge in Ghana. Or we've never had a Muslim as a Supreme Court judge. And this guy gets the opportunity and then he blows it away by infuriating Muslims, irritating us and hurting us. We don't have anything against him or his personality. But then, so long as he has touched us, we will respond. So long as he has touched the Almighty Allah. Because the inheritance system in Islam is divine revelation. It is the Almighty Allah that revealed it. So when you say it is discrimination, subhanAllah. Are you accusing the Almighty Allah of discriminating? That is what you've said. If he doesn't know the import of his message, if he doesn't know the magnitude of what he has said, then this is what he has said. He is accusing the Almighty Allah of discriminating against women. He needs to do tawbah on this. He needs to repent. Seriously. Because that statement is the statement of kufr. That's the Islamic way of inheritance discriminates against women and the prophet Muhammad didn't you see the inheritance that i'm mentioning in all these all these papers it is from the quran but as i said 
if you don't study your religion, that is what is going to end up with you. So those of you who are watching us, those of you who, by virtue of wherever you are coming from, you've read the secular education, secular education, secular education. You don't have time for your Islamic studies. You don't have time for Islamic knowledge. This is the kind of thing it will end you up. And coronavirus now has exposed something. Now that we are praying Tarawih in our homes, we are going to pray Tahajjud in our homes. This is where the weakness of some men in the Quran is going to be exposed. All you can do is school aloud, allow someone, let me read Allah Akbar, Lila Allah Akbar. You read Kulu aloud 13 times. Why? Because you didn't have time to study your religion. So instead of you being in a position to help your religion, you end up rather destroying your religion. Do you think this judge, when a case is brought in front of him and then he is on the panel, and then it is the issue of an interstate of a Muslim, do you think you he will pass and he will even vote in favor of us? Do you think he will do that? He wouldn't. Because his allegiance is somewhere. So, all that I've been saying for the past week, we've had a perfect scenario for it. Muslims who don't care about studying their religion. But then, they can jump to Google and Facebook and pick anything and paste. You see? Previously, Another person also said, some verses in the Quran, we need to clean them, erase them. Because they are discriminatory against women. You see? If you don't study your religion, you become exposed to all kinds of nonsense. But then when you are informed and then you study your religion, you are informed. You know when to take your left and when to take your right. It doesn't mean you are going to read Islam and then be a sheikh, be a mufti, be an alama. No. But then, at least, some of these issues, you have surface knowledge about it. It will guide you through troubled waters. But then, if you come zift, zero, you bring magic. So we've given examples, numerous examples, that shows that women, sometimes, in some scenarios, they, 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 they inherit exactly as men. In some scenarios, they inherit more than men. In some scenarios, wherever they are, they block the men from inheriting. In some scenarios, if they inherit, if it was a man who is in a position, he wouldn't inherit anything. It's only in one scenario that the man inherits twice what the woman will inherit. And the reason is that that man has been tasked with taking care of that woman and then whatever share he has she enjoys it with him but her share remains with her so the honorable nominee should come out and apologize to us if he really wants our support seriously he should come out and apologize to us to calm down our nerves. And may the Almighty Allah safeguard us. <laughs> so we're speaking about the characteristics of the Sharia. we done only two or three. Tomorrow we'll finish the rest and then we'll jump onto another thing. This is our wajib, our duty. If anybody pokes the Almighty Allah, we respond. And that's what we've done. So we are advising him. He should go and study. He should go and read. He should find scholars. And let them explain to him some of these things about Islam. Because the, the bench he's going to sit on is a supreme bench. Ignorance about some of these things is not tolerated on such a bench. Because if as a Muslim judge... You are ignorant about the importance of 
estate sharing in Islam. You are ignorant about the importance of hijab. Then we are in for trouble. So he should as a matter of agency go and study. He has sheikhs next to him. He should go to them. They shouldn't go to him. He should rather go to them and go and study. And read and take notes. Maybe he's doing takia for who? That's his problem. <laughs> he can do whatever takia he wants, but that is his problem. So, brothers and sisters, we'll take your questions now. Yes, he should be called to retract that statement and apologize to the Muslim woman. I'm expecting to see a, 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 a press release from the Office of the National Chief Imam concerning this. A press release from the Office of Al-Husun al Jamal concerning this. All we need to see urgent action from our leaders. Otherwise, our cases in the court is dead when it comes to interstate sharing. It is dead. So you should be called to retract that statement and apologize to the Muslim Ummah. So if you have any questions, we will take them. Today we've taken much of your time. One hour 25 minutes is because of, you know, the issue that is trending. So if you have any questions, we take them in 30 minutes. I know it's even far time for you guys to break your fast back home in Ghana. We here is 2, 2, 2 30 p.m. So if you have any questions, we'll entertain them. If you know them, we'll answer them. Yeah, if you don't know them, we'll jot them down. Yesterday, someone asked a question about taxes in Islam. Is it acceptable? Yes, Masalih Mursala. Masalih Mursala. Some of the scholars, yes, agree that, yes, if, if the state doesn't have enough money from Zakat, and Zakat normally is not given to state, it's given to individuals, but the state collects it and then he distributes it to individuals. If the state doesn't have If the state doesn't have that enough money to build hospitals, build roads, the state can, you know, uh, institute a tax that is not burdensome to the people and uh, they can take taxes. So in Islam, there, 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 is, there are taxes. You can take taxes. The government can take taxes. Yes, some of our intellectuals are a problem. Yes, it is true. I agree with you. Some of our intellectuals are a problem. Some of intellectuals are a problem. It's true. Some, not all of them. Some too are doing well. But like, when you go to the parliament house, there is uh, Honorable Baba Inusa. He's the, the chief clerk of the public accounts committee of parliament. The man loves the religion. He's an intellectual, but he's also an intellectual in the religion. He's not a sheikh, but then he's well versed in the religion. Honorable people like Honorable Ben Abdullah, people like uh, Honorable Muntaka. These are in the political field. You come into the business field, there are people there. But then the problem is, if you don't study the religion, that is where it becomes a problem. So if you have any questions, there is a... Yes, so I was saying about the taxes. Yes, there is... Uh, If the state needs the money for development, building hospitals, building schools, and, you know, building roads, you know, taking care of people, then the state can, you know, put taxes and then take the taxes and then and then help doing that. The taxes shouldn't be burdensome upon the, 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 the populace. Someone is saying, Sheikh, what if he belongs to a different sect? Cause these kinds of problems emerges when one belongs to Shia or Ahmadiyya. No, not not necessarily. Yes, the Shia have their problems. Yes, the Shia have the problems when it comes to taqiyya. Yes, they have that. But then I don't want it. I don't think it boils down to the fact that he belongs to a different sect or this sect or that. But then the fact of that is that he has made a gross statement that has the possibility of taking someone out of Islam, and he needs to apologize for that. And that is why we are here to hammer that. Uh -huh. So about three more minutes and then we call it a day and then tomorrow inshallah we'll look at the rest of the characteristics of the sharia two more or three more and then we move on to you know 
uh, other issues that we wanted to discuss in this month of Ramadan. Ramadan is going, is running very, very, very fast. And then uh, we need to wake up. We need to pray more. We need to do more Saraka. We need to do more Nafila. We need to help more. We need to love each other more. We need to forgive more. We need to clean our heart more. We need to make sure that these final days that we are entering, the last 10 days that we are entering, you should be, you know, passionate and strong about, you know, changing over the new leaf. It is not too late. Yes, maybe the first 20 days, these 19 days that we've gone through the month of Ramadan, you're a little bit like a desical, you're a little bit lazy. Finish hard. Finish hard. Especially these last 10 nights that we are going to enter it, like little color is in there. A night of power where when you ask the Almighty Allah anything, the Almighty Allah grants it. So let's make use of that. Let's ask the Almighty Allah to, 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 to clean our hearts, clean our souls, clean us, forgive our sins, provide us with good life. Why is it that most of our Zongo communities are not clean and the Imams don't advocate on that? Most of our problems is that most of our Zongos in the community are not practicing hygiene compared to the Muslim community. Can we tell why? The Imams are advocating for cleanliness. Maybe I don't know what you understand by cleanliness. The Imams talk about it. And then it is not only peculiar to Zongo communities. You go to the inner cities in Accra, it's more filthy than the Zongo communities. So this has nothing to do with a Muslim problem at all. It has got nothing to do with the Imams at all. If you refuse to clean your room, it is not the fault of an Imam. The Imam does not have to tell you that you must be clean. No. Your natural dispensation as a human being tells you that you need to be clean. And there are a lot of hadith where the Prophet Muhammad talks about cleanliness. And the Imams always say it. They preach on Juma bath, bath, and wear clean clothes. If the Imam tells you bath and wear clean clothes, he doesn't need to tell you that how clean your environment. Automatically, you must know that. So this has nothing to do with whether it is a Muslim community or a non-Muslim community. There are non-Muslim communities that are filthy. You know it. So it's not a peculiar issue with Muslims. Someone is saying on the issue of taxes, is it different for a Muslim to a non-Muslim? No. So long as, uh, for example, there is a special tax for the non-Muslims who are living within an Islamic state. That is jizya. Because Islam has made it compulsory upon the Muslims to pay zakat, the non-Muslims pay those taxes to beef up whatever the Muslims pay in terms of zakat. But if we are all in the country and then there is an Islamic state and then there are taxes that the Islamic state initiates for the populace. It does nothing to do with whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. No, we all pay the same taxes. But then zakat is only compulsory for Muslims. Non-Muslims don't pay zakat, even if they are in the Islamic state. So no Islamic state should say that because we have non-Muslims and then maybe the state has initiated an automatic way of extracting zakat from the accounts of the Muslims, it shouldn't implement that on the account of the non-Muslims. It is very, very discriminatory. It's very, very bad. You don't do that. It's against Islam. It is haram. But then, if it is, you know, call tax, import tax, road levies, then all of us will pay the same, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. Yes, another question. We take a final question and then we bow out for today and then we meet tomorrow. Yes, it means, yes, the Muslim pay more even in the Islamic State. It is your state. Why should, why should a, a, a visitor come into your house and then pay the bills? Why? It is your house. You take care of the bills. So in an Islamic State, the Muslims pay more than the non-Muslims. Definitely. If zakat is compulsory, and then you also have to pay taxes, and then a non-Muslim in the Islamic State only pays taxes without paying zakat, you pay more. Because you enjoy the state more than that non-Muslim. So you have to pay more, definitely. That is the musawat and adl of Islam. That is the justice of Islam.
you pay more definitely cumulatively you pay more you will pay more the islam doesn't see the minority as slaves when people are in a minority in an islamic state islam doesn't see them as slaves and even umar bin khattab instituted giving allowances to non-muslim pensioners in medina if you are old in medina and you can't take care of yourself umar bin khattab instituted an allowance for everybody whether you are muslim or non-muslim he gave to everybody so this is our legal system that a legal luminary said it is it is discriminatory. Okay, Sheikh, what amount of cash attracts the cat? Uh, it doesn't come off head, seriously. Uh, if you look at uh, 85 grams of gold, how much does 85 grams of gold, how much is it worth? I think it was 12,000 Ghana CD last year or so. Yes. So you take, you know, 2.5% of 85 grams of gold. So if, if 85 grams of gold is 12,000 Ghana CD, you take 2.5% of it as the cat. So it's 85 grams of gold, but I don't know the the, the the amount of head. So you just look for 85 grams of gold. Anytime you want to know zakat, just look at the price of 85 grams of gold at that time. It gives you the nisab of zakat, the amount of cash that zakat attracts. Thank you very much. If you have any questions later after the video is over you can send it into my inbox if you send it as a, a, a comment i might not be able to see it or read it but if it's in the inbox then it's my final question Sheikh, what is the islamic ruling behind the banning of muslim women from driving for example the ruling in saudi arabia this has nothing to do with islam banning a woman from driving it has nothing to do with islam because during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi the women rode camels, they rode horses. So it's just that it's the Saudi government's you know, discretion that uh, women are banned from driving unless there is someone with them, a mahram. Yes, the issue of mahram is very, very important in Islam. Yes, there's difference of opinions in between scholars concerning the mahram. But if it is about driving, there's nothing within the Islamic law that directly bans a woman from driving. She can drive. Yes, she can drive because Aisha rode a camel. Yes, she had a camel, she rode a camel. So the women there used to go to war, they rode horses, they rode donkeys. So if the Islamic law allows women to ride donkeys and horses and camels, then they can ride Lamborghinis and Bentleys and Teslas and Land Cruises and those of us, Corolla and Camry. Yes, she can do that. So buy your wife a very beautiful car and let her ride. It has nothing wrong in Islam. I mean, thank you very much for also passing by. Inshallah. Okay. That's money one borrowed equivalent to the said amount of trust zakat. No, the money you borrow is not for you. Zakat is only eligible on the money that you own. Your money. Yours. You can choose to do with it whatever you want. But if you owe someone money, you can't take zakat out of the money. Unless out of your own volition that you feel like giving out zakat. But then if it will affect you because you owe someone money, you owe someone 200,000 Ghana CDs. And uh, what you have, your own money is about, you know, 5,000 Ghana CD, 10,000 Ghana CD. You choose, to, your money is not up to the amount that can attract zakat, that you can give out. But then, that 200,000 Ghana CD that you owe somebody, it doesn't attract zakat because it's not for you. Because at any given moment, the person can come and take his money and you might end up in trouble with this. So they say, you don't give a gift to someone when you are owing. You rather pay your debts. So the money you borrowed doesn't. Unless it is money that you have took for business. So when you take when you're doing business, that's a different thing altogether. So you calculate and then you look at your income, your expenditure, and such like that. Uh, Sheikh, can you decide for your wife not to pursue higher education and work and or work? 
this is very dicey. But looking at the circumstances we are in now, a woman must pursue higher education. A woman must pursue higher education. But for one reason or the other, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think of any reason that will prevent that will make you prevent your wife from you know pursuing higher education and or work if you fear fit now or stuff like that's a different thing altogether. But looking at the conditions and the situations we are in now, our women must pursue higher education and work, especially higher education in Islamic studies. We need to encourage them, we need to push them because we need more doctors, more female gynecologists. We need them, we need the more of you know. Asma or Ayub, we need more of her. We need more people like Sohail and Muhammad. We need more of these women. Higher education, Islamic background. We need more of them. Okay, so please try and find a reason against the reason why you don't want to let your wife pursue higher education. Try and convince yourself otherwise. Please try and do so. Do so. You know, sometimes, yes, there's the fear. Or that when she attains higher education, she will look down upon you, stuff like that. Yeah, sometimes it's there, it's true. Sometimes the woman does not have any higher edu ed education, but then the way she will galaza you, you will know. So sometimes it has nothing to do with higher education. But the problem is if the woman doesn't have Islamic education and the fear of the Almighty Allah. It is become problematic. Problematic. Same way, if you the man, you don't have higher education in Islam, it becomes problematic. Sometimes we have very brilliant girls, Islamic education, school, we get up and then we take them and give them to stupid boys. Excuse me to use that language. Brilliant girls from Islam and the secular education. Beautiful girls. We just get up Take them and then give them to just anybody because he has money. He wretches the life of this girl, makes her, you look at the girl after three months and then she has changed together totally. So it's both ways. So at this point in time, I don't think there is any reason that will let us, you know, stop our sisters, our wives, our daughters from pursuing higher education. If you feel you can completely cater for your needs, yes, even if you can completely take. Even if you feel you can cater for her needs, she needs... A, let me tell you something. My mother is a Form 5 lever. And then she completed the Quran too. My father has his degree in Islamic studies. He didn't go to English school. He went to Arabic school. My mother was fortunate enough to go to the two, both of them. And I can tell you the impact that my mother has in my life. And my father himself, he always says it. He tells us that. Eh, he always says this. That our mother is his backbone. And since they got married. He was the one. He is taking care of us and everybody up till now. But then because she had higher education of her time at that time. It had impact in us. You understand? So, don't we cannot underestimate the role that a woman with a higher education can do in your home, even if you can take care of her. There are some professions that the Muslim woman must be in there, like teaching, for example. If you have a Muslim woman, higher educated, well versed in the deen, we can employ her as a teacher to raise and nurture the other children in the community, not only her kids. But then if she doesn't have that higher form of education, I don't think she will be able to, 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 to take care of that. So even if we can take care of her, sponsor her education, she stays, she, you take care of her. She is employed in a school somewhere. She is employed as a nurse. She is employed as a gynecologist. You take care of her, but then, her need, the, the society needs her. For example, someone like Asma Binti Ayub, the kind of job that she is doing. If her husband says no, she doesn't work. Can you imagine the kind of loss that the community will lose? Someone like Suhailat Muhammad, someone like Hajia Zelia. If her dear husband say no, imagine the kind of loss that the community. These ladies who let the hijab walk, imagine if their husbands have kettled them. Do you 
Imagine the kind of law. So uh, thank you for understanding that. So another question is, Sheikh, can you decide to share your zakat within people considering the condition of people during this pandemic? I don't understand what you mean by sharing within people. Yes, uh, the zakat is supposed to, you know, you know, solve people's problems. Some of the people, some, some so you can share it. Yes. For example, if your zakat amounts to 10,000 Ghana CDs, yes, you can share it into five. And give two two thousand two two thousand to people. I think two thousand Ghana cities can help someone start something small, not a big business, but something small that might be able to sustain them for some time as they also build upon. Because the cut, the idea is that is trying to you know eradicate poverty within the Muslim community. So yes, you can share it, but then something reasonable that can help them. But if your zakat is not huge. For example, to help someone start a business, yes, give it to someone. So if, for example, if your zakat is about 500 Ghana CD, give it to one person for them to, you know, survive for a week. It's okay. Instead of, you know, excuse me, breaking it down to, you know, 100 Ghana, 100 Ghana, about five. 100 Ghana now in, you know, Ghana term is just one money, one note. And then the person can just destroy it in one day. Especially nowadays that the internet is very, very, you know, expensive. Wow, the longest we've ever done in the month of Ramadan. One hour, 46 minutes. We are hitting the two hour <laughs> mark. I've forgotten the last time I spoke for two hours. Sheikh, hopefully you go through the property sharing tomorrow again, inshallah. Okay, no problem. We'll try and see if we can repeat it again for clearer understanding. And then we'll try to We'll try to do a PDF on that. Uh, you know, we we'll try to write it up because it's in Arabic, but I'll try and translate it into English and then see if we can distribute it so that people will get, you know, a clear understanding of what uh, we we are trying to say. So, inshallah, thank you very much for that. We'll try to re remind tomorrow and then we'll also try and then write it down. Just a write up about that and give these examples and then we'll publish it so that people can read and get understanding that. But then, finally, before I leave you, remember to say a prayer for, for the nominee. Let's say a prayer for him. You know, as much as we hit the hammer on his head today heavily, let's not forget to say a prayer for him. And let's not forget to say a prayer for every Muslim who is struggling with his deen. We are all struggling to please, please the Almighty Allah. Some of us, our sins are bigger. Others, their sins are down. Yes, to end with this, uh, a sister, I won't, I won't mention her name, contacted me in my inbox that she's a revert. And then she's trying to, you know, do her own way, her own might in trying to, you know, you know, propagate Islam and teach people Islam. And uh, she doesn't claim to know everything in Islam, but she just wants to share Islam to her people but then the kind of backlash she gets from people on social media and stuff like that as we we're speaking she was actually weeping and crying i say this let's always correct people correctly you can see in my lecture today i was trying as much as possible to control my choice of words so that i wouldn't you know you know, drag the issue away from its intellectual, you know, scene to it to being just a personal attack and a trade against the, the, the person of, the, of that individual. So, for example, the reverse that we have in us, if they are trying as much as possible to propagate Islam, and we find out that one, two, three, that they've said is wrong according to Islam, let's correct them correctly that they'll always remember that message we gave them. And then anywhere they stand, they will repeat that correct statement that we gave them. But then if we make statements like, hey, Yoshi, when? When did you accept Islam? Karabani like you. What do you know? Come and let us teach you rather Islam. You revert. No. 
almost all the Sahaba were reverts. Yes. And received the deen from them. Let me tell you something. You see, reverts, they've tasted something that those of us who were born in Islam, we didn't taste. They've tasted the bitterness of kufr. They know what kufr is and how bitter it is. They've tasted it. So now that they've come to taste the sweetness of Iman, when they remember others who are not Muslims, and then they know how it feels to be a non-Muslim, and then now come and accept Islam, they have that feeling. So they think, they feel, let's help to bring these people in this sweetness too. Even those of us who, by virtue of us being born in Islam, and by virtue of the fact that we've gone to study, we make mistakes. We say wrong things in the religion. So these reverts, when they are doing da'wah and then they say something wrong in the deen, when we are correcting them, let's correct them in a more compassionate and passionate manner. And even those brothers that are hitting their head that they've not studied Islam and that they pick and choose from Google, I advise them nicely, even though sometimes I have to knock their heads to bring them back onto the path. I don't call them names. I don't insult them. I don't bastardize them. Well, like they are trying to also propagate the religion. But sometimes they do it wrongly and then they, they give out wrong information. That is what we are talking about. We are not discouraging anybody from doing da'wah or calling people to Islam. No, that's not what we are doing. All we are trying to do is make sure you give out the right information. What we are trying to say is don't, you know, metamorphosize into a self-acclaimed mufti where you give fatwa left, right, and center. I didn't talk about, I didn't talk about, you know, reverse doing dawa or the young scholars doing dawa or the secular oriented Muslims doing da'wah. No, it's not about da'wah. I spoke specifically about giving out fatwa. And me that I'm sitting here, that you are listening to me, I am not accredited to do fatwa. At all. I'm not accredited to do fatwa. So, please, the rivets that we have amongst us, and then they are trying to you know, practice Islam or do Dao, Wallahi, let's encourage them. If they do mistakes, let's call them aside and advise them. If I do a mistake, advise me. We all commit errors and blunders. But then if we raise it up high and then call them names, we rather discourage them from doing Dao. Look at Khalil Yassin, a rivet. Look at Malcolm X. A rivet. Look at Bilal Phillips, a rivet. I think Abdul Hakim Quick also. I don't know. I'm not sure about him. A rivet. Look at our own Isa or say the late the May the Almighty Allah bless his soul and grant him Jannah. Look at the kind of dawah Isa or say did in Ghana. And there are a lot of rivets in Ghana who are doing marvelous jobs for the religion. Do you know why? They tasted kufr and they are now tasting Islam. That is why sometimes you find them sometimes more steadfast than us in the religion because we have not tasted what kufr is. They have and they know how bad it tastes. So they are willing, eager to pull others out of that situation. This lady tells me that her mother died as a non-Muslim. And any day she remembers that, she weeps, she cries. She doesn't want any other person again to die as a, as a non-Muslim. So she's striving to do her widow's might, to send the message of Islam. Maybe through her, someone might understand Islam and come into the fold. So if she makes one mistake, let's not destroy her 99 good deeds. Because of one mistake that she had done. Finally, 
ask the Almighty Allah to bless us, to safeguard us, to protect us, to increase the love that we have for each other, to be soft and easygoing with each other. When we are going to correct an issue, we talk about the issues and hit on the issues hard, yes. But when we are dealing with each other, the rifq will lean malatf, with softness and subtleness and forgiveness, especially in this month of forgiveness. Thank you very much for listening to us. By popular request, we'll repeat it part two tomorrow and then we'll finish the characteristics of the Sharia inshallah tomorrow and then the day after tomorrow we might look at uh, another issue we are we have about more issues to look at in the month of Ramadan but we don't have that enough time to do so thank you very much for listening to us those of you back home in Ghana it's 3 p.m. now here in Detroit Michigan we have about five hours and 40 minutes more to go before we break our fast so if you see me slowing down it means the engine the fuel is going down and uh, i'll have to call it a day thank you very much don't forget pray for me well i i always say this pray for me that the almighty allah wash my heart so that i'll do this job sincerely for the almighty allah and pray for me that my tongue who always speak the truth. And if I say something that is wrong, pray that I'll be able to overcome my ego and return and come and correct that wrong statement that I made. Pray for me that the Almighty Allah will overlook my mistakes and that the Almighty Allah will not use me to send the religion to you and then you understand it and you enter Jannah, but me on the day of Qiyamah, the Almighty Allah will throw me into hellfire, even though I might be the catalyst that stimulated you to do better in Islam. So please, it's very, very important for me. It's very scary. You do all this job. You come to the Hirat after an Allah says, Zero, I'm not impressed. We did it so that people will praise you. That is what I fear most in my life. Thank you very much for staying with us. Barakallahu fikum. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم